Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome uh, at this symposium. Thank you for joining us here. I am Ineke Sluiter, the current president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. We are very pleased that over 300 people have registered for this symposium on planetary health. Unfortunately, the symposium will be fully online, obviously due to the corona restrictions, but the pandemic has also clearly illustrated the complex relationships between man and nature, which happens to be the topic of today's meeting. This was very well described by the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, convened by the WHO Regional Office for Europe, in their recent report entitled Drawing Light from the Pandemic, a New Strategy for Health and Sustainable Development. This report states, and I quote, COVID-19 is a zoonotic inf infection caused by a virus that jumped the species barrier. However, it is human activities such as deforestation trade in and consumption of wildlife and international travel that are believed to have led to the insurgence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and facilitated its global spread. This has profound consequences for us all. We and our descendants now face a precarious future unless urgent remedial action is taken." End of quote. You will hear more about this in the talks this afternoon. The pandemic has also led the Academy to develop several initiatives to inform the general public and spark off uh, scientific discussion, but also to advise our government. We have organized webinars, uh, but also three advisory reports have been started, including this one on planetary health. So three advisory committees have been put into place and the Committee on Planetary Health has organized today's symposium. The board of the Academy has asked the advisory committee, Planetary Health, to look into long-term issues of sustainability that need to be addressed in the recovery phase of this pandemic, whenever we reach that phase. More specifically, the advisory committee will carry out an exploration of the scientific knowledge that is needed in the field of planetary health, and it will identify priorities for knowledge development in the Netherlands. One important concern is that the COVID-19 pandemic should not slow down the transition to a more sustainable society. With regard to controlling climate change and loss of biodiversity, for example, the 2020s will be a crucial decade. It is therefore important that recovery from the pandemic does not simply mean a return to business as usual. With our initiatives on planetary health, the Academy would, on the contrary, like to highlight the role that science can play in accelerating the transition to a more sustainable society. We are very pleased that two of the founders of the new planetary health discipline and two Dutch experts have agreed to tell us more about the health risks of anthropogenic environmental changes on a planetary scale, about measures that we can take in response to these risks now, and about remaining questions that need further research. Let me again welcome you and pass the floor to Johan Mackenbach, chair of the KNAW Committee Planetary Health and also our chair for the symposium today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ineke, for this uh, short introduction. My name is Johan Mackenbach as uh, Ineke has just introduced me and um, I would like to uh, open this uh, symposium with a short um, introductory speech on the title of um, Planetary Health, Old Wine in New Bottles. <clears throat> 
we are, as Ineke said, delighted to have such a big audience, which illustrates the growing awareness for the uh, potential health risks of uh, global environmental change. But some people ask, isn't this just old wine in new bottles? And I'll try to answer that question in a moment. Um, first of all, uh, planetary health is um, a very catchy term, a very catchy title. Uh, uh, metaphorically speaking, we can speak about the planet as being healthy or ill. And that's the way in which this term is sometimes used in this metaphorical loose sense of referring to uh, the homeostatic mechanisms that keep our planet in balance and that may now be disturbed by the influence of us human beings. But the term planetary health, as we will use it today, refers to a new rapidly expanding field, which deals with the interface between global environmental change and human health. It is rooted in public health. Uh, this new uh, field, uh, that's to say, um, it's, it's ultimately rooted in medicine, but it reaches out to other disciplines because many issues in on this interface can only be tackled by working together between disciplines. It is a field of research, perhaps primarily, but it's also a field increasingly of education, of practice, and it's even a, a movement as illustrated by the Planetary Health Alliance, which brings together many people who also try to advocate changes needed to uh, prevent human health impacts of global environmental changes. It's a very new field. Um, it dates back only to 2015 um, with a publication in the Lancet by a commission uh, founded by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Lancet, and uh, which has published the paper of which you see the first lines on, on the slide. Published in 2015, but since then, the field has grown rapidly. Uh, the first professors of planetary health have been appointed in some places in the world. There has become a Planetary Health Alliance, just mentioned, a new journal, the Lancet Planetary Health, and uh, recently two textbooks of planetary health have been written, which bring together the uh, existing knowledge on this field, written by authors, two of whom we are happy to welcome among our speakers of this afternoon. The field of planetary health deals with the issues illustrated in this graph. And I'm sure that Sam Myers, who developed this graph, will go into more detail explaining uh, what planetary health is uh, during his presentation. But let me um, briefly explain it to you now. Planetary health deals with the global environmental changes uh, mentioned here in this part of the slide, like climate change, global pollution, biodiversity loss, and how these changes ultimately affect human health um, through, for example, impacts on food production, infectious disease exposures, etc. cetera, um, sometimes modified by policies, um, new technologies, changes in culture and behavior, which uh, modify the impact of the environmental changes on human health. And this whole field is dealt with by people working in planetary health. But what this uh, graph doesn't show clearly is that there are also feedback mechanisms from the health situation of the population and from healthcare towards the drivers of global environmental change. For example, in the form of healthcare being one of the forms of consumption which actually drive global environmental change, for example, by uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Healthcare can also play an important role in modifying the effect of global environmental change on health, for example, by uh, developing adaptations to climate change. This is the field of planetary health, and is this old wine in new bottles? 
Well, to some extent, I think the answer to that question is yes. There are clear overlaps with other fields, just as, uh, just like uh, uh, 20 years before 2015 in the 1990s, uh, scientists proposed to define this new field of eco health, which has a very similar orientation to planetary health. And to some extent, the field of one health also has big overlaps with planetary health. And that's because sustainability concerns are fortunately widespread and have been taken up by scientists and practitioners in many fields to see how they can contribute to counter the uh, negative effects of global environmental change. At the same time, the answer to this question of whether planetary health is old wine in new bottles is also no. Um, this is to some extent a new integrative framework uh, around human health as a common denominator of many of these changes. And it makes sure that this framing of global environmental change in terms of what the potential impacts are on human health, it makes sure that there is a stronger involvement of the medical profession in dealing with these issues. The Commission of the Royal Dutch Academy of Arts and Sciences, which I chair on planetary health, has been created uh, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, as Ineke Sluiter has just explained. And its main tasks are to review the existing evidence, what do we know, and then to create a research agenda around the question of what do we need to know. And like planetary health as a field, this commission will also approach this in an interdisciplinary fashion with a focus on issues that can be tackled by the Dutch research community and also trying to balance the need to create new scientific knowledge with the need to contribute to the urgent solution of today's problems, which is, of course, not always easy because particularly basic science, uh, normally leads to answers which uh, take a long-term view, whereas the current problems for which the Netherlands and other countries uh, are facing with uh, also require urgent solutions, and we will try to balance those two perspectives in our advice. We are just starting as a commission we we have been working for um, a third of a year more or less and um, when i try to review what we have reached so far i can give you a few examples of what we as a commission think we do know um, and uh, some of these insights are at a meta level for example it's quite clear that the issues that planetary health deals with are very complex in terms for example of the very long causal change existing between global environmental change and human health it's also a very heterogeneous field uh, for example the exposures that we deal with are very different which implies that uh, insights from very different disciplines have to be synthesized when we try to summarize what we do know. At the same time, the picture that emerges from our review of the evidence makes it very clear that humanity is in a dangerous spot. The health impacts of global environmental change are uncertain, but potentially huge, and they do require an answer. It's also clear that there are important healthcare aspects, for example, uh, a possible role of healthcare in terms of mitigation or adaptation to these global environmental changes. At the same time, uh, the list of issues on which we have to admit that we do not know enough at the moment is almost overwhelmingly long. Climate change has been investigated quite intensively also with regard to its impacts on human health, but the other global environmental changes have been investigated much less intensively. For example, what will be the long-term impact of biodiversity loss on human health? We hope that Thijs Kuipen during today's program will enlighten us a little bit on that important question. Other important questions that we still do not have a 
clear answer on are how to feed the world's population a healthy diet within planetary boundaries. That's another important issue that we hope that uh, aided Feskins will um, help us a little bit further on. And these are not only questions in, in terms of health sciences or um, in the natural sciences, there are also important um, questions in the field of the humanities, for example, how to include intergenerational equity concerns in decision making. How do we take into account the fact that most of the effects of climate change and biodiversity loss will affect our children and grandchildren instead of ourselves who have benefited from the economic growth which has produced these problems in the first place. So there is a, a very long list of issues that still wait to be researched and uh, as a committee we will try to draw up uh, a research agenda that makes sense also in terms of what the Netherlands can contribute in these areas. That brings me to the end of my introduction, but I'd like to, to end with um, raising the question of why there is not yet a clear sense of urgency that we need to tackle these issues in planetary health. And to raise that question, I'd like to go back to one of the uh, first authors who have drawn our attention to planetary health issues, Tony McMichael, who in a book published in 1993 was one of the first to uh, raise these concerns. And in the introduction to his book, he, he also wondered how come that we still do not feel the urgency of, the, of climate change and other global environmental changes in terms of their impact on human health. And he then wrote that the idea that the survival of us humans may depend upon the sustaining of ecosystems still seems a bit far-fetched. That's what he wrote then. Is it? Is it a bit far-fetched? That's one of the issues that we will deal with this afternoon. And we will do that in a program that you have all seen with four speakers, all speaking in a remote fashion. Um, starting in a moment with Samuel Myers, then Thijs Kuiken, then Edith Veskens, and finally Andy Haynes, uh, another of the three authors of the uh, textbooks that I've illustrated a moment ago. And we will end this program with a panel and general discussion uh, towards the end. Those of you who would like to make an active contribution to this symposium by sending us, by asking questions for as input for the discussion, please follow the guidance in this slide. You can use the question and answer option in the Zoom menu bar below. Uh, and please make sure that uh, you make clear to whom your question is addressed. Thank you for your attention to this introduction. And I would now like to give the floor to our first uh, speaker, uh, Samuel Myers. Samuel is a principal research scientist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and also the director of the Planetary Health Alliance. Um, his presentation is pre-recorded and will be uh, started in a moment. Greetings to all of my esteemed colleagues in the Netherlands. I'm very sorry not to be able to be there with you in person for your planetary health symposium and uh, very, very pleased that you are all taking on this uh, really important topic. Let me um, share my screen with you and um, see if let's see okay um so i was asked to give you all a little bit of an overview about um, the field of planetary health um, and uh, our growing understanding about the ways in which our own disruption and transformation of our planet's natural systems is coming back to affect uh, human health. Planetary health is a field that's really uh, born in what I think is a unique moment in human history and comes out of a deep sense of 
urgency about the rate and the scale of change uh, around uh, our planet's natural systems. It is a unique moment when um, by many metrics, there's really never been a better time to be a human being. We've seen uh, truly extraordinary improvements in wealth and health over just the last uh, 75 years or so. Um, the number of people living in extreme poverty uh, has dropped uh, from 62% of the world's population to only 10% uh, between 1950 and 2015, despite nearly a tripling in the uh, total human population. And at the same time, life expectancy has been rising really quite steadily over that same period of time from uh, 46 on average to 72. So we've seen these dramatic improvements in human development in really one person's lifetime. Uh, but the same extraordinary sort of scientific and technological achievements that have fueled those improvements in human well being have also been driving a massive expansion in the size of humanity's total ecological footprint. These are graphs of human consumption of resources globally over time. And what you see is whether you're looking at uh, appropriation of fresh water or proliferation of motor vehicles or production and use of synthetic fertilizers, paper production, plastic production, uh, or primary energy use, you see these very similar curves with relatively modest consumption patterns until around 1950, and then these steep accelerations in, in our global uh, consumption. And not surprisingly, when you look at measures of our impacts across our planet's natural systems, you see similar patterns with relatively modest impacts until about 1950, and then this steep, almost exponential increase, whether you're looking at um, loss of biodiversity, exploitation of fisheries, addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, ocean acidification, or loss of tropical and also temperate forests. And the reason that these graphs all look so similar is that they're all underlain by these two fundamental processes. One is uh, the very rapid growth in the human population, which was really pretty stable for most of human history. And then around 1900 went up about a billion people and very rapidly since 1950 has increased so that we're close to 8 billion people today and on our way to something like 10 billion people. And during that same period of time, we've seen even steeper increases in per capita GDP. So the goods and services that each one of us is asking our planet to provide. And when you multiply those two numbers of human population growth and growth in the per capita GDP, you get the growth of the total GDP of humanity. And what you see is that we're sitting on this nearly vertical line of uh, rising demand for our planet's goods and services. And it's hard to overstate the extent to which um, we've really ballooned our ecological footprint and are now fundamentally remaking our planet's natural systems to feed ourselves every year, We've converted about 40% of the land surface for croplands and pasture. We're using about half the accessible fresh water on the planet, mostly to irrigate our crops. Uh, we're fishing 90% of monitored fisheries at or well beyond the maximum sustainable limits. We've cut down around half of the tropical and temperate forests on the planet, dammed 60% of its rivers, and that, and that number is on its way up to about 92%. Uh, we're struggling with a really global scale uh, set of challenges around pollution of air, water, and soil. As you all know, we're disrupting our planet's climate system. And because of all of these massive disruptions of nature, we're driving species extinct at about a thousand times the baseline rate. The population sizes of mammals, fishes, birds, reptiles, and amphibians has actually been reduced now by almost two thirds since 1970, according to the latest WWF numbers, and about a million species are facing extinction. So there's just been an extraordinary 
extraordinary expansion of our impact really across all of nature. And the core premise of planetary health is that the scale of the human enterprise now really exceeds our planet's capacities to absorb our wastes or to provide the resources that we're using sustainably. And as a result, we're transforming not just the climate system, but also biodiversity, biogeochemical cycles on the planet, changes in land use and land cover, global scale pollution, scarcity of resources like fresh water and arable land, and that all of those large scale anthropogenic disruptions are interacting with each other in complex ways that we are just beginning to understand, but that affect the sort of core foundational conditions for human health, the quality of our air, the quality and quantity of food that we can produce, our exposure to infectious diseases, our exposure to extreme weather patterns, even the habitability of some of the places that we live. And we're starting to see these impacts across every single dimension of human health. And so, for example, in my own research, we've done a lot of work showing that when we grow staple food crops, things like rice and wheat and corn and soy, at elevated concentrations of carbon dioxide, where we expect the world to be in this century, that those crops are losing important amounts of critical nutrients for human health, protein and iron and zinc. And when we studied this effect uh, using free air carbon dioxide enrichment methods, which is really the gold standard now for growing crops in open field conditions, we found these significant shifts in the nutritional value of the food that we eat. And when we've modeled over the last several years, how those changes in the nutritional profile of our core staple food crops might affect human health across the populations of 152 countries, we found that on the order of 150 to 200 million people in the world would be likely to be pushed into new risk of deficiencies of zinc and protein, and that nearly a 1.4 billion women and children would be at risk for uh, increased rates of anemia because of significant loss of iron intake. So when we think about how shifting the biophysical conditions of the planet will come back to affect our own health, this is work that relates to sort of a subset of the climate change nutrition conversation. We're also doing work very actively right now on how uh, declines in pollinating insects are affecting our access to foods that are critical in preventing uh, non-communicable diseases and what the global health effects of not having enough pollinators may be. We're doing work on how ocean warming is leading to changes in the size of fish and also the numbers of fish and also changing the geographic distribution of where the fisheries are and moving them away from the tropical areas where they're most important for nutrition and toward the poles. We're doing work in Madagascar where we're looking at the importance of access to wildlife in the diet to provide critical nutrients and showing how reductions in wildlife populations are really threatening nutrition in those communities. And these are just a few areas where I or my colleagues are working closely around biophysical change and nutrition. But of course, there are many other critical issues like how water scarcity is affecting food security, how degradation of arable land, population displacement is a really important issue around nutrition because as people are get displaced, they clearly have less access to the food that they need. And we often see malnutrition and displaced populations. Pollution is another factor. So ground level ozone, for example, is a potent plant toxin as well as being a respiratory toxin uh, and it suppresses yields of some very important crops for uh, human nutrition and then of course surprises so as we tinker with all the biophysical conditions that underpin the global food system we're going to continue to experience surprises in terms of the rippling systemic effects uh, on uh, the food that we depend on
And of course, we could create an equally complex diagram for all the other dimensions of human health, infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, mental health, and displacement and conflict. So you know, very quickly, um, when we think, for example, about infectious disease, our exposure, particularly to vector-borne diseases and some of the diseases related to spillover of pathogens from wildlife populations, what we call zoonotic diseases, um, is very sensitive to changes in the world's biophysical conditions. And so we're seeing around the world shifts in the pattern of malaria, schistosomiasis, leishmaniasis, dengue fever. Here in New England, where I live, we're seeing shifts in Lyme disease. We're seeing chikungunya fever moving north. So we're seeing shifts that relate to changes in temperature, soil moisture, the biological composition of communities, addition of nutrients to wetland systems, um, all of those things can affect uh, our exposure to infectious diseases. And of course, we're living through right now this COVID-19 pandemic, which is a um, clearly was a spillover event from uh, wildlife into uh, humans, uh, in this case, probably related to either a lab accident or a live animal market, but we've seen many instances of these spillover uh, events and uh, diseases like Ebola, SARS, Nipah virus, and on and on, because of a fundamentally risky relationship that we have with wildlife populations where we're seeing agricultural incursions into wildlife habitat, bushmeat hunting, wild animal trade, extractive industries, all of these ways that we move into places where wildlife are living and may experience these uh, spillover events of new pathogens coming into our own population. So we can expect to see shifts in the pattern of infectious diseases as a result of all of these different kinds of biophysical change. A third dimension of health is, is really um, population displacement. And every year for the last several years, in fact, I need to update this slide because the numbers just came out, uh, for this past year that I think it was 84 uh, million displaced people. But each year seems to break the record for the highest number since the beginning of the UN HCR record keeping for the number of displaced people around the world. And clearly what's driving population displacement is complex and multifactorial. But it's also clear that accelerating environmental changes is one factor that's really contributing to uh, displacement. For example, uh, the Syrian civil war was preceded by the worst uh, three-year drought in the instrumental record. And clearly that plus government policies and government uh, governance failures led to a breakdown in the societal structure and to the huge issue around uh, displacement in Syria. The non-communicable diseases are also being affected. The big um, Lancet pollution and health report that was published a couple of years ago uh, argued that we're seeing about 9 million excess deaths every year as a result of pollution of air, water, and soil. That number probably needs to be revised up because a recent study this year by colleagues here at Harvard and, and some other universities showed that we're seeing about 9 million deaths a year just from combustion of fossil fuels from the particulate air pollution. So clearly the total number has to be higher than that. And it's not just pollution that's driving non-communicable diseases. For example, my own work on pollinator declines shows up to half a million deaths a year today from not having enough pollinating insects to optimize the yields of the foods that protect us from heart disease, strokes, and certain cancers. And so we're seeing increases in mortality, particularly in places like Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, because of high baseline risks of those diseases and then removal of some of the foods that protect us uh, from getting uh, mortality from those diseases. Um, my work on carbon dioxide and food crops suggests that we're seeing a shift where we're losing protein in staple food crops and we're adding carbohydrate. And when we do that experimentally to human populations and we look at how it affects their risk of heart disease, we see increased risk of heart disease 
if we remove protein from the diet and substitute it with carbohydrate. Now we're doing that experiment sort of on a global scale with the entire human population. And it's very worrisome that we, we may, as a result, be increasing the risk of heart disease. These women in Bangladesh are experiencing another flooding event. It's been shown um, that the risk of eclampsia in pregnant women in Bangladesh is rising as a result of both sea level rise and poor water resource management, which is leading to saltwater intrusion into coastal aquifers, and as a result, more salinity in their groundwater, which directly correlates to the risk of eclampsia in pregnant women, as well as high blood pressure in adults in coastal Bangladesh. So all of these sort of not necessarily intuitive ways that our changing the biophysical conditions of the planet is coming back to affect our own health. And then finally, uh, mental health is one of the least studied areas, and I think potentially one of the most important, where clearly the increasing incidence of these extreme um, natural hazards, the fire season that we saw last summer throughout Canada, the United States, Europe, uh, Siberia, um, the hurricane seasons that we've been seeing in the Caribbean, you know, over and over, we're seeing more and more of these natural disasters, and we know those are associated with very significant mental health effects. What we know less about is this sort of pervasive mental health burden from what's being called ecological grief or eco-anxiety, this sense that we are changing the world at a rate that has become a danger, that our consumption patterns in the wealthy parts of the world are putting the poorest people in the world and future generations in harm's way. And what is the mental health burden that we experience as a result of that knowledge? What is the mental health burden we experience from knowing that our children or our grandchildren may never see a flourishing coral reef or an elephant in the wild. And these are questions that really need to be answered. So I would argue that there are a few um, key points uh, that I wanna emphasize. The first one is that these health effects are pervasive, that we're seeing significant effects for not just lower income countries and lower income populations, but all over the world from things like pollinator declines, uh, changes in the nutritional value of our food, uh, changes in exposure to infectious diseases, uh, pollution that's leading to non-communicable diseases, et cetera. The second point is that these are large effects when we compare them with the kinds of conventional risks that we really are worried about in public health. These are large effects affecting potentially hundreds of millions of people uh, and millions of excess deaths. I think it's also important to say that we're really right at the beginning of the field. The field is only about six years old now. There's a lot to learn, um, particularly we really don't know enough about how changing biophysical conditions are affecting global nutrition. We don't know enough about the mental health effects, and we don't know enough about how changing environmental conditions are infecting, affecting the habitability of places where people live and driving uh, displacement. Surprises are plentiful. Many of the effects that we're seeing, things like uh, rising CO2, making our food less nutritious, or sea level rise, driving eclampsia in Bangladeshi women, these are not effects that we would have anticipated. And we can um, imagine that there will be more and more of these surprises as we continue to alter the biophysical conditions that we as a species have been adapted to for thousands and thousands of years. And finally, when we think about all the things that there are to do about these threats, which aren't the focus of my talk, but there's an enormous amount we can do to try to address these problems. And many of the interventions that we would want to support will also have very significant health co-benefits. So there's sort of a, an important overarching point, which is that um, a lot that we need to do around muscle powered locomotion, vegetable based diets, clean energy sources, building cities around biking as opposed to automobiles and walking, um, greener cities, a lot of these interventions are going to be good for our health. So um, there's no danger that they would be wasted efforts, even if somehow we were able to solve uh, the major environmental challenges that we face. So let me stop there and thank
thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. And I hope you have a wonderful and um, also very productive uh, conference. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel Myers, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, as I said at the beginning, this was pre-recorded. Unfortunately, uh, Sam couldn't join us at this very moment. Um, but we will uh, address any questions that his uh, presentation may have given rise to at the end of this meeting, together with other questions related to other presentations. For now, we continue with our program, and I would like to give the floor to our next speaker, Professor Thijs Kuiken, Professor of Comparative Pathology at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, who will talk about one of the main pathways, common pathways, linking global environmental change to human health, infectious diseases. Uh, Thijs, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Johan. I'll just start my screen. There it is. So I'd like to uh, continue this uh, symposium with a talk on global environmental change and pandemics. And yes. Um, in this talk, I'll give you some examples of outbreaks that have occurred in past decades. And I'll also indicate the current approach to these outbreaks. I'll indicate that despite this current approach, there's still a high risk for pandemics and show you that by some more recent outbreaks and that therefore we need a different approach and that this could be the planetary health approach. So in the last 40 years, there's been an increase in the emergence of zoonoses, infections coming from animals to humans and causing epidemics or even pandemics. And Kate Smith and others showed that between 1980 and 2010, using the Gideon Network database, there was a significant increase in infectious disease outbreaks, both in human-specific infections shown here in dark orange and in zoonotic infections shown in light orange. And they show that important underlying causes for these emergence events were increased human incursion into forests, increased numbers of farmed animals and increased trade and transport of animals. And for each of these causes, I'll give you an example of something that's happened in the past 40 years. So AIDS emerged more or less in 1980 and is an example of an outbreak that occurred as a result of increased human incursion into forests. Historically, there have probably been people living in Central Africa who have been infected by HIV-1 or HIV-2, etiological agents of AIDS for many decades. However, this has never led to outbreaks because these people were located in small communities in the forest. However, things changed in the 1950s. There's increased deforestation and road construction, expansion of human communities and associated increased connectivity, allowing these sporadic events to result in a regional epidemic and then to spread globally through increased ship and air travel. And now AIDS is endemic in the human population and has caused uh, over 40 million deaths until now. And the same drivers for emergence are also associated with other global problems, namely biodiversity loss, the habitat loss through deforestation, and uh, the hunting of wildlife um, is the cause of this. And the deforestation has also been important for climate change, namely through increased greenhouse gas emissions. High path avian influenza or bird flu is an outbreak 
associated with increased numbers of farmed animals. Historically, bird flu has occurred in poultry flocks, but was easily kept under control by conventional measures. However, as a result of increased consumption of poultry meat and eggs, and therefore also increased production of poultry worldwide, the populations have become so large that it's no longer possible to keep um, high path avian influenza out of poultry populations. And although the risk of um, becoming infected through contact with an infected chicken is small because of the high numbers um, of infected animals and the high numbers of contacts, um, such transmissions do occur occasionally at poultry culls and at also at live animal markets. And there have been several hundred such events um, in the past years. And although this has not led until now to a pandemic, there is a risk that um, if the virus changes to an efficiently transmissible virus, this will occur. Associated global problems with the same uh, drivers are biodiversity loss due to habitat loss from land use for feed crops for poultry, and also climate change as a result of land use change, particularly deforestation leading to increased greenhouse gas emissions. So SARS is an example of an outbreak associated with increased trade of animals, specifically wild animals. It occurred in 2002-2003 in starting in, in Southeast China. And historically in Southeast China and in some other countries in uh, Southeast Asia, it is a tradition to eat wild animals occasionally, including uh, small carnivores and rodents and snakes. Um, but as a result of the increased wealth, there has been a rapid increase in the consumption rate of these wild animals and therefore also a rapid increase in both the trapping in the wild and of farming of these wild animals resulting in the emergence of a coronavirus from a wild animal at such a wild animal market possibly a palm civet um, which spread first regionally and then again globally resulting in one half year in about 8,000 cases of SARS of whom 800 have died. Through good public health measures and good diagnosis, it was possible to stop that outbreak. And again, this, uh, the drivers for, for this uh, disease are associated with biodiversity loss, mainly through wildlife trapping, including um, trapping of endangered species. So the current approach to dealing with these emerging pathogens can be shown here in this uh, WHO roadmap for research and development and consists of four different areas. Firstly, to establish a surveillance network as an early warning system to detect pathogens in animals and in humans. Research to better understand the pathogenesis, natural history and epidemiology of these emerging pathogens. Developments of vaccines and therapeutics and bring these um, to market to interrupt the transmission between humans and from animals to humans. And finally, a mechanism for the global donor community that gives a line of sight for manufacturers from the preclinical pre stage to the post-licensing procurement of products. So while these uh, this approach has been uh, effective in stopping outbreaks after they occurred. They haven't been so effective at actually preventing their emergence. And in a recent uh, report by IPES on pandemics and biodiversity, it was stated that our current approach is to try to detect new diseases early, contain them, 
and then develop vaccines and therapeutics to control them. Clearly, this reactive approach is inadequate. And I'll show you a few examples indicating that indeed um, there have still been major um, epidemics, pandemics occurring in recent years despite the current approach. Ebola occurred as a big epidemic in 2013, lasting until 2016 in West Africa. And there are many similarities between the emergence of Ebola and the emergence of HIV um, 30 years previously. Again, the area where the outbreak took place is an area where there had been heavy deforestation in the preceding 10 years. There had been a rapid increase in the human population and there was high mobility both within and between countries, allowing um, this virus to um, spread in the, the human population and resulting in over 28,000 cases of whom uh, 11,000 died. Bird flu um, has never left us since it uh, first emerged in uh, the 1990s uh, as a, a, a H5 high path avian influenza virus and the current clade 2.3.4.4 um, has been with us in Europe for the last few years. Um, and in fact, it's gone from bad to worse with uh, um, the most uh, extensive outbreak occurring last winter in Europe with over 22 million birds died or killed in 31 countries and reports of disease in wild birds, uh, more than 2000. As this virus spreads in poultry and in wild birds, it also is occasionally affecting humans. There have been uh, regular, although a very small number of uh, human cases in the last few years in China and then Laos, um, about 45 with a, a market increase just in the last year. And about half of these people who had had contact with uh, infected poultry um, have died from the infection. So how do we deal with trying to reduce the emergence of these epidemics or pandemics coming from animals? Finally, I, I just want to show you the current outbreak that we're dealing with, um, uh, COVID-19, which emerged in 2019, and again is very similar um, in, in its uh, pattern of emergence as SARS nearly 20 years ago, again occurring um, in Southeast China, um, probably from a, um, a wildlife market, the Huanan seafood market, where the first cases were concentrated around uh, and had contact with this market. And again, spreading worldwide, this time it was not possible to stop it. Um, but it has become um, an, a pandemic and uh, um, where uh, it is be becoming established in the, the human global population with uh, um, 260 million confirmed cases so far and uh, over 500 million confirmed deaths from uh, COVID-19. So the current measures are not able adequately to stop these emerging infectious diseases. And there are other global problems for which the current measures also are not sufficient. Um, in particular, biodiversity loss, um, as Sam Myers indicated, um, there's a um, increasing rate of extinction of uh, vertebrate animals um, in, in recent years and ongoing, despite many attempts by the United Nations and several um, conferences uh, making targets to try to um, reduce this biodiversity loss, most recently in 2010 in Aichi. With regards to climate change, um, the climate uh, is, has, has there's global warming occurring. In the last IPCC report in 2019, it was indicated that the average global temperature increased by 
one degree Celsius above the pre-industrial average, despite um, an agreement in 2015 to try to keep this temperature to below two degrees Celsius or and possibly one and a half degrees Celsius. So what do we need to change to um, actually turn these events around? I best in 2019 um, indicated that the goals for conserving and sustainably using nature could only be achieved through so-called transformative changes, a fundamental system-wide reorganization across technological, economic, and social factors, including paradigms, goals, and values. And similar conclusions were reached, although in slightly different wording, by the IPCC in 2019 for the climate crisis and by the IPBES workshop on pandemics and biodiversity in 2020 for pandemic risk. And since these global problems have several drivers in common, uh, addressing them together is a win-win-win situation. So to go into the recommended solutions from the IPBES pandemics workshop, I concentrate first on the transformative changes. And I think that it's really important that we carry out research that allows us to make these changes means in the first place a reassessment of our relationship with nature, perhaps from a more anthropocentric to a more ecocentric worldview or narrative. And secondly, a reduction in our unsustainable consumption patterns that are driving this pandemic emergence, but also the biodiversity loss and climate change. Going more into detail into the solutions relative to disease, disease emergence, um, the uh, workshop report gave five different categories. And um, I'll give you an example for each of these categories, although the list is much longer. Firstly, they recommended enabling mechanisms. For example, a high level intergovernmental council on pandemic prevention, similar to that for biodiversity and for climate change. Second, policies to reduce the role of land use change in pandemic emergence, for example, by instituting impact assessments for pandemic risk when preparing major land use projects. Third, policy to reduce the role of wildlife trade in pandemic emergence, for example, by instituting an intergovernmental partnership where not only we look at conservation of wildlife, but also look at the disease risk of wildlife during international wildlife trade. Fourth, closing knowledge gaps, for example, performing research on the relationship between ecosystem degradation and restoration and disease emergence. And last but not least, uh, fostering a role for all sectors of society to try to engage in pandemic risk reduction for example, by providing incentives to avoid high pandemic risk production and consumption patterns. So in my view, this, these transformative changes fit well with the planetary health approach. Um, I uh, quote uh, Sarah Whitney from that first uh, Lancet publication that uh, uh, Johan also referred to. And they indicate that um, there needs to be recognized that there are benefits to health from nature conservation and from mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Sam Myers, in an opinion article in The Lancet two years later, indicated that clearly a new paradigm was needed for public health to bring it closer together to nearly every other facet of uh, human activity. And finally, uh, more, most recently, Hinchcliffe in uh, Lancet Planetary Health indicated that there was a need for a radical change in relationships between humans, animals, and the environment in order to reduce the emergence of new diseases. 
So in conclusion, I hope to have shown you that pandemic emergence, biodiversity loss and climate change have several drivers in common, that the current approaches are not adequate to address these problems, but that transformative changes of human society are required to do so, and that these transformative changes fit with the planetary health approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thijs, for this high-level overview. Um, we have time, perhaps, for two questions. Let, let me start with a general question. Um, so it, it, it seemed to me, listening to your um, presentation, that you uh, presented, that you see um, the, the pandemic emergence uh, as a parallel phenomenon to these global environmental changes, um, which you're, you're probably quite right to do so. But do, do you also see a causal connection between, for example, biodiversity loss and the risk of new pandemics? Is biodiversity loss leading to more infectious disease? Could you briefly comment on that? Yeah. Yeah, you... Question? you, you, you uh, um, uh clearly uh, address uh, an issue that is not easy to answer because biodiversity loss can be both a, um, a driver for um, disease emergence. For example, when there's a, a reduction in some species, but there's an overhand of species that are more um, uh, likely to have pathogens that can infect people and cause um, uh, disease emergence. And on the other hand, um, uh, um, biodiversity loss can also be um, a, a uh, uh, in, in some cases, it can reduce the risk of, of uh, uh, transmission of pathogens from animals to humans. So it's, it's, it's not easy to answer. And it's also, uh, you have to look um, at different levels. So it's sometimes uh, the same um, uh, problem at a local level uh, there's a, a, a positive um, uh, correlation between biodiversity and the risk of infection of humans, but at the uh, larger level, um, that that that, that um, uh, correlation is is not no longer present. So that, in particular, is is something uh, difficult to answer. I think it's m most what what you can say with much more certainty is that the same drivers for biodiversity loss are also the drivers for um, pandemic risk in humans. So that yeah. clearly yeah. is um, a, a, a correlation that, that holds um, over time and across different systems. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, you made it very clear in your presentation. There, there is one other question that I think uh, we could uh, ask you to address. Um, is there an overview of evidence on which production and consumption patterns uh, lead to the highest pandemic risks um, and would therefore be the most effective to address? This is also a, a big question, of course, but could you comment on that one? Um, well, I try to, I, I indicated that, that the, the, the important causes of uh, um, disease emergence are related to high um, farm animal production. So obviously um, uh, the consumption of products from farm animals is also a, a, a high risk product. Um, wildlife trade um, is, is also a, a risk. So any uh, consumption of, of uh, products associated with the wildlife trade um, are, are a, a high risk product. And we may think that we don't have them in the Netherlands, but for example, the, the fur lining of uh, winter coats, um, when they're real fur, are often made from raccoon dogs. And raccoon dogs are mainly um, farmed for this production in China. So um, the, the um, uh, buying a coat with such a raccoon dog fur lining um, is uh, um, actually driving. Um, the emergence of uh, infectious diseases. Interesting. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps one of the surprises that uh, Sam <laughs> Myers talked about. Yes. But th thank you again for your presentation. And we, we now move on to the uh, next speaker, uh, who is Professor Edith Veskens, Professor in Global Nutrition at Wageningen University and Research. Uh, Edith, uh, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, thank you, Johan. Thank you also for inviting me. Uh, I want to share my screen, obviously. Otherwise, there will be no PowerPoint. Um, yes, I think this should work. Okay, I, I think uh, I'm uh, happy to be here as uh, after uh, Thijs Kuiken. I can continue talking about systems and about farm animals, at least uh, for a bit. And it's also apt because uh, now in December or this year, we were especially busy with the United Nations Food Systems Summit. And we have in December uh, a unique uh, summit, Nutrition for Growth, uh, with the aim to ensure that everyone, including the most vulnerable, have access to safe, affordable and nutritious food by 2030 all inspired by the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, most of you will know well, where we are often involved from nutrition side in zero hunger. It's also clear that a good health and well-being, but also many other things, uh, Sustainable Development Goals play a role in the discussion on planetary health as we have today. Mm, you think there are many plenty of graphs showing food systems frameworks and I'd like to focus just on this one for simplicity. Uh, we talk about food system from agriculture through the whole food chain which ends up with delivering food on our plate and obviously uh, there are environmental drivers which play a role and obviously there are social economic drivers which play a role. But note that Originally, in the past, it was mostly about producing enough calories for, uh, you know, uh, feeding the whole global population. But now we are talking more about only food security. We're talking also about healthy diets and safe diets. We're talking about inclusiveness and equity, equity. but also, obviously, also about sustainability and resilience of the systems. In nutrition, sometimes in Dutch, there's sometimes confusion, futsal and voeding. I'm from the nutrition part and we are concerned about the food, but especially uh, in the ways like how we choose it. We are not animals, so we choose our foods ourselves. And in addition, so this means that we want the food to be uh, desirable or <laughs> affordable also. And we are concerned about what happens in the body, the bioavailability of the nutrients, which in essence then gives rise to growth development, but also disease or prevention of disease in case of the healthy diets. So I actually realized that the agriculture so far, so the food system so far has done quite well in terms of providing sufficient calories. Remember in the 1930s, there were only 2 billion people globally. Now we are with seven and still we are there. But now the challenge is we are worried about 2050. Can we feed the world by that time? But like you see here, there have been calculations on, for example, proteins, calories and vitamins, which are grown, harvested, distributed and available for human consumption, eaten and required. So this shows that actually we eat too much protein. So we, we can eat less and I'll come back to that later. Obviously, this is just a global picture. If you look and zoom in at the different parts of the world, there are huge differences. On the left, the picture of Peter Menzel of a family in Chad. On the right, in Mexico. And you also already see the health impact. On the right hand side, more obesity, and more childhood obesity. And on the left hand side, more hunger and wasting. But I also like to draw your attention to an important an other malnutrition outcome, which is perhaps less visible to the eye, and that is what we call stunting, which is a short height for age. And you see this example for children in India. Their growth line is uh, their growth curve is lower than what you would expect for children age eight years. And this is an intergenerational cycle. Stunted young girls become 
malnourished mothers and also the liver underweight babies. So this is a this nasty cycle, and in the end, also not is you know affects height, but also impacts childhood mortality, but also cognitive development, and hence income, labor cost, and economy costs. Another thing I'd like to discuss with you, because that's not often visible, is what we call hidden hunger. It's not only caused by the lack of food, but by the lack of high quality food. So the lack of vitamins and minerals, obviously, again, on the left hand side, what we call hidden hunger. But also in our high income societies, our Western world, for example, in the elderly, in elderly homes or in subjects with obesity who have enough fat, carbohydrates and energy, but not sufficient nutrients, vitamins and minerals. What we do in the guidelines, and you know all this, we, we know what we should eat, more or less, and the optimum somewhere in the middle, not too much and not too little. We have recommended daily intakes where we can calculate that 95% of the population has enough of a certain vitamin or mineral, and we have average requirements. But note that in case of hidden hunger, you are at the average requirement only, and indeed are on your way to a real deficiency, although it's not completely there yet. So just give you an idea about the calculations behind our guidelines. And obviously we know that the problem is still massive, despite our wealth, malnutrition in all its forms. We have about 2 billion adults with overweight or obesity globally, and also 2 billion people suffering from the so-called hidden hunger, and only, luckily, less than 1 billion nowadays, which go to bed hungry. But we are not sure what the COVID situation will do, and we are afraid that on the left-hand side, more problems will occur. Now, the Global Burden of Disease study has shown that diet is a very, very important determinant of disease and perhaps not so well recognized in the medical sector so far. You see here the, the contribution to the disability adjusted life years globally. And you see here diet itself, and that was a combination of uh, fiber, so whole grains and fruit and vegetables, account for quite a number of disability adjusted life years, especially because of coronary heart disease, stroke and certain types of cancer. But obviously also within the systolic blood pressure, we have a dietary component, salt. The high body mass index obviously has a very high dietary component, high fasting plasma glucose, idem dito, and high cholesterol, the saturated fat. So clearly, diet is an important determinant of overall health, and unfortunately, also not equally distributed across the globe. And within each country, as some of you asked in the, in the questions, in the, in the Q&A, also not equally distributed within, within countries. So currently, the food-based dietary guidelines are not only focusing on nutrients, but also on foods. And this is because a consumer goes to a shop, not buying vitamin C, but selecting oranges. Uh, but also, especially, we have a lot of information nowadays, especially from observational studies on the relationship between foods and disease. And based on this, for example, the Dutch example, now the Fooding Centrum, the Dutch Nutrition Center, has developed a food-based dietary guideline, which is called the Wheel of Five. Now, so far, also our Wheel of Five only includes very little attention, not much attention, I would say, to sustainability. While on the other hand, obviously we know diets, sustainable diets are not only healthy, nutritionally adequate, safe and healthy, but should also be protective and respectful of biodiversity and ecosystems, be culturally acceptable, be accessible, economically fair and affordable, and indeed also optimizing natural and human resources. And here you see already the link with the topic of today. And you mostly know already uh, that the animal products such as meat, for example, contribute a lot to the greenhouse gas emissions. And if business will be as usual, this contribution will increase even more. So 
While for fruits and vegetables, you see here the dark blue, the issue is more, for example, blue water use. Interestingly, I discussed this previously with Johan Mackenbach, there are many, many feedback loops which create that climate change, and don't look at it in too detail, but trust me, that climate change impacts malnutrition and malnutrition in itself also impacts both through the, the agriculture and the agriculture impacts the climate change. So there are these interesting feedback loops, which also make it somehow, you might think, difficult to tackle. Uh, some of you in the Q&A already mentioned the Eat Lancet uh, report, and I'm happy that I can tell you a little bit more about it. It, it appeared uh, two years ago in uh, February or January 2019. And it took the planetary boundaries into account, greenhouse gas emissions, nitrogen, phosphorus, water use, land use, and also biodiversity. And I must admit the biodiversity calculations are somehow still a little bit tricky. Uh, this is the diet proposed. So half of the plate or your daily plate should consist of fruits and vegetables, a considerable proportion of whole grains. And you see here the animal sourced protein in a much smaller amount, ideally. Yeah? So this is what has been proposed. You see it here in grams per day and here in kilocals per day. And again here, a limited number or amount of protein sources. And note that this is a range, which is a quite wide range in some cases, but here this range includes zero. And I come back to that later. The current situation, it much too much animal food and uh, the starchy vegetables, and obviously also little of the fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, for example. This is globally. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, also this situation differs across the globe. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the meat is quite right, but the starchy staples can be less. While in South Asia, also the meat and fruit and vegetables are much less than you would um, think. Is this Eat Lancet report helpful? Well, you must realize that this is a global perspective and zoomed in 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 countries or, or um, continents. But actually, you know, many in the world are not meeting the protein and micronutrient requirements. We have hidden hunger. Remember the 2 billion, and this is hidden hunger is due to deficiencies in iron, zinc, iodine, and vitamin A. So this is a discussion. And also think that the benefits of animal foods are definitely there. For example, for meat, high quality and bioavailable protein and heme iron, which is readily bio, uh, bioavailable and vitamin B12, which is not cannot be delivered by uh, vegetables or plant-based foods. So there are issues in nutrition. Yes, reducing meat intake is fine, but I must say I'm not you know, I'm much more nuanced when I sell this message in sub-Saharan Africa, where I work quite a lot, than uh, what I will say to you uh, when you are from the Netherlands. The protein requirement also is in, still in, uh, under debate. In a normal adults, 0.8 grams per kilograms per day, but we know for the elderly, uh, we need more. So that is also an issue we need to take into account uh, in respect also with the protein bioavailability. Apologies. Um, nutrition is strongly related to agriculture, and this is also the nice way of uh, this planetary health issue where the interface between nature and health is there and man is there, which is in nutrition. Uh, the global panel has uh, on agriculture and food systems for nutrition has uh, released a very nice report and I'll cite some of the results there to, to think about possibilities. So the possible actions on future demand, well, let's say reducing the demand, like in the Eat Lancet, also filling the production gap. In agriculture, there can still in higher yields to be achieved. And especially also, you know that as a consumer, avoid losses, not only in the food chain, but also indeed in your own kitchen. So potential solutions which have been 
discussed reduce food waste, precision agriculture, so there's still sustainable intensification possible, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, reduce water use, still possible, Remember that in our greenhouse gases, uh, <laughs> the greenhouses in the Netherlands, the casa, water use of for tomatoes is 50 times lower than when you use that and grow it in open area. So there's much to learn there. And also sustainable food processing is an important thing to innovate on. And on the right hand side, the things I myself am working on more, like updating the food based dietary guide, guidelines in many countries to include also sustainability goals. And next, and that is the crux also, to improve dietary intake accordingly. Because remember, in the Netherlands, we have this wheel of five, but we also know that only 5% of the Dutch population eats according to this opt optimal diet guideline. Next, the availability and accessibility of vegetables and fruit, very important products, but they are fresh, they are perishable. So there's also innovations to be made in the food chain and in the food system. And finally, a socioeconomic factor, equity between the socioeconomic groups and empowerment of women is a very important issue to address from the nutrition point of view. In view of time, I will skip this, but this is from this nice report I showed you earlier. So still many questions to be asked, although indeed the planetary boundaries have been calculated and, and modeled into a diet, but still the optimal diet, but also including taste and texture, affordability, desirability, is important to investigate. Another issue which hasn't been discussed so far in this symposium is the disconnect or at least the connection we need to make with the private sector, the public and private sector in various areas or, you know, somehow separated in public health nutrition, we argue that we want to use the private sector less. On the other hand, because of the logistics and the production, we also need them. So how to relate to the private sector is an important issue for discussion. Uh, and finally, many policies are there on paper. We need data for future monitoring modeling, but we also need actions and work in practice. And we need many stakeholders and many sectors to try to get this, to change this transformation in the food system. Again, as like the previous speaker said, a transformation of the whole system is really necessary. And with this introduction, I'd like to close my presentation. Thank you very much, Edith, for your very nice overview. Um, let me see whether there are questions that I can't see them on this screen. We have time for one or two questions. Um, and relating, uh, for example, to the uh, initiatives to develop food guidelines. Um, how, how, how would you characterize the situation, Edith? Would it be possible, at least theoretically, based on, on the available science, to develop a wheel of five that does take into account sustainability yeah. uh, aspects? Definitely. The Eat Lancet diet, as proposed, uh, is already such a food-based IRT guideline, I would say. And the questions we have from a nutrition point of view is more that is it affordable? Is it culturally acceptable? It's more that, you know, in the translation to, to the consumer itself, that we have questions uh, right. of haalbaarheid, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but not so much on the content itself, although differences, different choices can be made. And like I said, what we do in our group is, is indeed also modeling uh, exercises, greenhouse gas emissions, land use, water use. The biodiversity aspect is a little bit more difficult to, to feed into models <laughs> because of the quantification issues, for example. But in the Eat Lancet, they, they looked really at the impact on forest uh, forestation and, uh, and that ki uh, kind of thing. So I, I they really did very well. You can have detailed, you know, on questions on the details, but overall, 
fine, I would say. My okay. questions are more in, in uh, relation to the translation to the consumer itself and the possibilities of changing uh, food choice and consumer behavior. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we need to move on in our program. So I would like to give the floor to our last speaker, uh, Andy Haynes. Professor of Environmental Change and Public Health at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and author of one of the two books that I briefly mentioned in my introduction. Uh, Andy, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Johan. Can I just check that you can hear me and see, my, and see my slides? I hear you and I see your slides. Excellent. So, um, well, some of these publications have already been mentioned, so I won't say much about them. The Lancet Rockefeller Report 2015, I had the honor of, of co-chairing that commission. And many of the ideas uh, that I'm gonna to touch on were first advanced by that commission. And I acknowledge obviously the input of, of many colleagues in, into the work of the, the commission. And more recently, this, this book, which uh, attempts to bring forward some of these issues in the light of emerging ev evidence. So let me start with this. Uh, this, this slide, which shows you what we've already heard really from Sam Myers, but I want to focus really on what the challenges for research and action are, because I've been asked to focus particularly on the kind of research, the implications for research of some of these um, emerging concepts and ideas in this broad field of planetary health. You can see on the, on the right side of the slide, the Earth system trends that have been discussed by other speakers, and you can see that they're very dramatic indeed. And so that we're now in a completely different geological epoch to the one in which uh, human civilization grew up. So for 11 and a half thousand years or so, we lived in the Holocene epoch, which was an epoch of stable climatic conditions. It was the time during which humanity emerged from being hunter gatherers to agriculturalists to urban dwellers. But now, certainly since the middle of the last century, and some people would say before that, we're now living in the Anthropocene epoch, and the Anthropocene is characterized by the dominance of human activities on natural systems. And as you've already heard from other speakers, these dramatic changes of the Anthropocene threaten to undermine the progress in health and wealth, albeit very inequitable, but there has been progress, uh, which humanity has um, experienced uh, over the last seven or eight decades, something of that order. So what are the challenges for research and action? And I would start off by saying that I think research is not just about observing these trends and cataloging them and describing them. It really has to be about devising evidence-based action and accelerating the implementation of those actions in order to try to safeguard health in the Anthropocene epoch in the face of these dramatic environmental changes. So there are a number of challenges to developing a research agenda. One is that we're dealing, as we've already heard, with complex systems, and complex systems have non-linearities. They can have discontinuities. They can have um, sudden changes uh, in, uh, in input and output variables. So you can get collapse of ecosystems, for example, which could suddenly um, take us into a completely different state from which we could not easily retrace our steps. Many of the effects are delayed. So if we wait until, uh, for example, climate change, parts of the world become uninhabitable. By that time, it'll be too late, of course, to adapt to these changes and too late to stop these changes. So we have to make decisions now, bearing in mind the impact on the health of future generations and also young people um, alive today. And we have to devise and implement some of these suggestions in the presence of uncertainties. And therefore we have to minimize the potential for adverse unintended consequences. Much research is focused on single sectors and on single disciplines. Most of us were brought up with a single disciplinary perspective, and that's how we were trained. We were trained to work in a fairly narrow silo. But this kind of approach won't work in the Anthropocene. It may have worked in the Holocene, but it won't work in the Anthropocene. So we need intersectoral action. We've already heard how policies, actions, interventions in a range of sectors are essential in order to help us to adapt to that environmental change that we can't prevent, but also prevent further and potentially disastrous environmental change that we can't adapt to. So intersectoral action is important and it's going to be vital. And that has to be fed and watered and nurtured by, by transdisciplinary knowledge. And that is a challenge to current research funding and research governance systems, many of us, many of which were set up to tackle rather different problems. <clears throat> 
Uh, alongside that, we have policy silos. So again, just as there are different sectors, different disciplines, there are also different policy makers. And when we look at the way governments are set up, they're not set up to address these complex intersectoral uh, issues. They're set up along specific ministry lines. Uh, and yet many of these challenges cut across a whole range of ministries. And we've seen that, of course, with COVID, and we'll see it with climate change and many of these other challenges. The other important thing is that we need to act, we need to intervene. We can't wait for the perfect evidence uh, before we act. So we need to act, but evaluate our actions. And that means that we need to co-design these actions, co-design potential solutions with stakeholders. Otherwise, they won't be acceptable. And we need to modify some of these actions, some of these interventions uh, in the light of evolving uh, evaluation. Uh, and course correct. If, for example, some of our actions are having undesirable consequences, we need to correct them uh, as quickly as we, as we possibly can. So what is the difference then between transdisciplinary thinking and interdisciplinary thinking? We've heard some of this already. I think many of us are fairly familiar with multidisciplinary thinking. We've worked increasingly, we do work with other, other disciplines and there are additive uh, benefits from doing so. And in interdisciplinary uh, activities, research activities, we interact um, to try to shape the research agenda and the research solutions uh, in the light of the discourse, the dialogue between different disciplines, accepting that no single discipline has a monopoly on the kind of evidence or the perspe perspectives that are needed in order to address some of these planetary level challenges. But there's also a higher level approach, which many people call transdisciplinarity, in which there is a higher level, if you like, meta level of, of synthesis of these ideas. And that means we need to understand the languages of different disciplines. We need to foster research funding opportunities, which allow people to interact at a very early stage to create a much richer uh, and more solution focused, more implementation focused approach to transformative changes that, are, as we've heard, are going to be necessary in order to guide human civilization successfully uh, through the Anthropocene. This slide just shows us, and it touches on some of the illustrations you've heard from other speakers, it shows you how the planetary boundaries are related to human health. So how the health of natural systems are related to the health of human populations, how the drivers of environmental change lead to various pressures. The drivers like consumption and population lead to pressures like the, uh, the uh, generation of greenhouse gases, for example, how these leads to states like cl climate change, acidification of oceans, for example, and then how these states change the exposures of human populations to important um, determinants of human health, whether those be air pollution, uh, diet, physical activity, uh, socioeconomic, um, factors as well. And these, of course, have effects across a range of health outcomes, ranging from the non-communicable diseases, infections, undernutrition, and malnutrition in all its forms, and of course, mental health. Many of those pathways we're still understanding, but some of them we do understand. and We do know broadly the kind of actions that we need to take. But the complexity, of course, comes from needing to consider all these planetary boundaries at the same time. And although we are increasingly understanding the effects, for example, of climate change um, and land use change, for example, on human health, there's very little health, uh, health type or planetary health research going on, looking at the interactions of, of these different planetary boundaries. And that's an important task, I think, for, for health of the future, because there may be synergies between them. Um, and there may also be, in terms of policies, there may be policies that will help us to address a number of these planetary boundaries at once. And I think the Lancet Commission um, has shown the way on that. So what types of evidence do we need to generate in order to act in the best way that we can in the face of uncertainty, in the face of rapidly evolving knowledge? Well, we need, obviously, we do need more scientific discovery. We do need to understand the mechanisms, the understanding of complex causes uh, of, uh, of the effects on human health with these multiple concurrent environmental stresses. So I think no one's arguing that we need more scientific discovery. But more knowledge by itself will not necessarily direct us towards a safer course for humanity. We also need to understand how we can accelerate the implementation of those findings that we already have. How can we scale up some of the insights that we already know about? And that involves research in behavioral sciences, maybe even in political economy, uh, across a range of disciplines that are not um, necessarily 
the normal bedfellows of public health research. It also involves at the other end of the spectrum working with our system scientists or ecologists, people working on biodiversity and so on. It's going to be important to assess whether there are tipping points. Tipping points are points um, in a system where a sudden collapse of the system may occur. Sudden state shifts, as they're often, occur, often called. And these state shifts may be unalterable. They may not be possible to, to reverse them. You see this on a local scale, for example, when a, a freshwater ecosystem collapse, collapses as a result of nitrogen loading and you get a, a loss of biodiversity deoxygenation of the water and a collapse of many of the aspects of the natural system. So there may be natural uh, tipping points in a range of natural systems at the global and regional levels, for example, the Amazon or the permafrost melting and, and so on. But then we also need research to enable action. So that means that in addition to modeling, which is very important because modeling gives us an indication of what kind of the, the potential implications of implementing a range of different actions. We also need to understand uh, what actually happens when you try to implement some of these actions. So we need evidence-based development and evaluation of the effects, largely beneficial, but some may be harmful as well, of these adaptation and mitigation actions on health. And this will help us to have an overview of progress towards nationally and internationally agreed targets using robust indicators. That has begun. There are a number of initiatives as the Lancet countdown and so on, climate change. But the, the indicators are still imperfect and we're not monitoring them in many populations which are experiencing some of the most dramatic changes in environmental exposures. And then we also need translational research and implementation science because there's no point in this uh, th these kind of insights just sitting uh, on a shelf or on a bench somewhere. We have to also look to see what happens when we implement them and this research needs to address the on-the-ground on realities in different contexts. Well, this slide just shows you the complex exposure pathways related to climate change and health outcomes, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, but I just wanted to illustrate the fact that climate change caused by the accumulation of greenhouse gases and climate active pollutants, the effects of climate change are modulated by a range of demographic and socioeconomic and other environmental factors that influence the magnitude and the pattern of risk. And we know that there are a range of exposure pathways ranging from the most obviously direct ones like heat stress, extreme weather events, to those mediated through natural systems like food, for example, infectious diseases of various types, the destruction of natural systems by wildfires affecting air quality, and then those um, impacts mediated through socioeconomic socio systems, increasing poverty, migration, and perhaps conflict as well. So we need to understand these pathways much more effectively than we do at the moment, not just for climate change, but a range of other um, uh, environmental uh, changes. And so this recent paper shows you an attempt at topic mapping, which is a, uh, an approach using partly machine learning uh, and other approaches to, to synthesize the evidence about what we know already, in this case about climate change and health, but you could apply it to other environmental changes. So it's an attempt to map out the publications that we have at the moment. It doesn't tell us how good the quality is, but at least tells you the kind of topics that they try to deal with. And you can see that um, of those papers uh, looking at climate change and health, most of them are around the impacts of climate change and health. A minority are due to uh, are focusing on actions, mitigation and adaptation. And in mitigation, for example, there's quite a cluster in China around air pollution, decarbonizing the energy system, reducing air pollution, improving health. Uh, and in terms of adaptation, there's quite a lot around um, disaster resilience, reduction in vulnerability, reduction in extreme events, vulnerability, and so on. And the cluster of literature on mental health is dominated by articles from North America. Um, there's a little bit of literature also on suicide risk in relation to environmental change distributed um, across global regions, but very small um, in numbers. So this just helps us to understand the current focus of research endeavours. But there's a lot more that we can do, I think, to improve the research um, endeavour, the research uh, activities that we are funding. And there's increasing evidence to suggest that we can now separate those effects of climate change and other environmental changes that are due to natural variability from those that are due to human activities. About 70% of over 400 extreme weather events in a recent review uh, and trends were found to be made more likely or more severe by human-caused climate change. And that means we can separate 
the natural availability from the human effects. And the left side of the slide shows you what would look the world's, world's climate would look like without anthropogenic climate change. In other words, we wouldn't have any change in temperature. As it is, we're about 1.2 degree average, global average temperature. And what we're able to say, or the climate scientists are able to tell us now, that some of these events wouldn't have occurred without climate change. So the Siberian heat and fires of 2020, shown on the right side here, were almost impossible without climate change. So that means we can start to apportion the reason or the cause of different adverse effects on human health. And this is just an example of it being done for heat related deaths in a very recent paper in the last couple of months in Nature Climate Change, showing that more than one third of heat related deaths um, over the last few decades can be attributed to climate change. They very unlikely to have happened in the absence of human induced climate change. But we can also see from the map, although the data was based on over 700 sites, there are big gaps in the data. So virtually no data from sub-Saharan Africa, apart from South Africa, much of Asia, much of Russia, for example, are, are just blank on the map. So there's a lot we don't know about what's happening in these vulnerable regions. And we really need to fill in those gaps. So we need much better systems for um, mo monitoring environmental change, what we've called a planetary health watch system, which would allow us to improve discovery, um, surveillance of disease outbreaks of changes in health, linking them to global environmental change, and then to support evidence-based uh, decision-making. And currently we have very poor linkage between human health and environmental uh, indicators. So uh, we proposed um, a system which would um, use much more, uh, capitalize on the increases in computational power, remote sensing, um, linking of data on health and environmental change by researchers to allow us to move forward on a range of fronts, both discovery, surveillance, and decision-making, uh, using open access uh, software uh, that would allow this data to become more interoperable, but also more accessible by researchers. But that will require investment. And of course, many research funders don't want to invest in surveillance, don't want to invest in improving capabilities because they see it as someone else's responsibility. But without this, um, these linkages, we won't be able to make necessary scientific steps forward that we need. And in thinking about this, it's useful, I think, to distinguish between two types of data. One of the kind of hotspots of environmental change, the impacts of environmental change on health and on a range of environmental indicators. And then the opportunity sites, the sites where action is feasible, possible and desirable and can be monitored. So it may be sites around forest protection, reforestation, sustainable cities, for example, Increasingly, health systems themselves, which we know are major uh, producers of greenhouse gases, for example, but an increasing number of healthcare systems are making the commitment to decarbonize their activities. So documenting the implementation of some of these opportunities. So we have these two types of action, mitigation, the actions to reduce emissions, in this case of climate change, but it could be other uh, environmental factors as well and adaptation action to manage the risks of those effects that we can't fully prevent. These two communities, again, tend to be very separate. They often don't really work together. Increasingly, we need to um, actually integrate these different communities. And we also need to build a much stronger evidence base, particularly in low middle income countries. A recent systematic review, and I would say research since uh, systematic reviews are really crucial in this area, um, showed that only two studies out of over 1500 were actual formal ex ante evaluations of climate change adaptation response in low middle income countries. So enormous gaps in the research literature, which need to be filled as a matter of some urgency, if we're going to adapt and mitigate uh, uh, to environmental change successfully. We also need much more structured approaches. So this, um, I'm not going to detail this diagram, but it's taken from a paper that a whole range of us were involved with um, uh, fairly recently published in Environmental Health Perspective. And what we tried to do there was to develop a kind of framework, a coherent framework for those researchers working on the healthcare benefits of mitigation strategies. So we've heard already that as you decarbonize the economy, you reduce air pollution deaths. As you move towards sustainable diets, you can prevent millions potentially of, of deaths due to um, poor diets, which also are having big environmental uh, impacts. As we move towards more sustainable transport systems, we can also reduce air pollution, but increase physical activity with big potential benefits. So we're talking about millions, millions of potentially preventable deaths by the right kind of strategies. But the problem is at the moment that research that we've got is not really fit for purpose. 
because people are using a whole range of different approaches. They're measuring greenhouse gases, environmental impacts in different ways over different time scales. So it's awfully difficult to come up with consistent metrics and to summarize, to do meta-analyses of these research. So increasingly, we need established guidelines that will help researchers collect the data in the most rigorous way. Modeling, as I've said, is, is really important, but we need to do, go beyond modeling. And we need to actually try to evaluate uh, what happens when we try to change behavior, both locally and at scale. So some of these approaches to developing and evaluating complex interventions that we've used in health systems research, for example, need to be adapted for planetary health. And this is just one of these frameworks. And it really raises the whole importance of um, looking at the context, for example, uh, having being informed by an appropriate program theory, um, engaging the right stakeholders, accepting that we have uncertainties and in integrating economic uh, considerations and including implementation science. Would you try to wrap so in up? Conclusion, you, yeah. yeah. So in conclusion, uh, let me say that um, it's, research has a really important role in identifying the key tipping points, not the tip, just the tipping points that are taking us towards uh, a very damaging future, but also the tipping points that can take us away from that trajectory to a much safer uh, and more sustainable and healthy future. We need to emphasize the opportunities for and the benefits of change. And we need to evaluate and catalyze the uptake of policies, uh, technologies, and um, in, uh, interventions that can help to put us on a course that will safeguard human health within planetary boundaries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andy, for your presentation which was really excellent. Um, let's first see whether there are any specific questions to Andy and then move to a more general series of questions in the remaining time. One of the questions that um, were raised um, specifically for Andy's presentation is, do you actually believe that we are beyond successfully implementing mitigation measures, I assume this is about climate change mitigation measures, and should instead focus on knowledge creation regarding adaptation? Thank you. Yes, that's a very important question. Look, we are, we're not going to, I don't think, going to keep below 1.5 degrees. I think that's been very clear. I was at COP26 just a couple of weeks ago. Obviously, it was kind of predictably disappointing um, in as much as you know, there wasn't the ambition there to keep to 1.5 degrees. And it would take really dramatic transformations. I mean, you'd have to reduce emissions by um, over 7% uh, per annum sequentially for years and years and years. And that's not going to happen. But look, we don't know where some of these um, tipping points exist. So we have to fight for every... 0.1 degree, maybe every, every 0 0.01 degree, uh, I think, because we still don't know where some of these tipping points uh, may be that would take us towards some kind of irreversible state shift. Um, and I think there's, so, so we can't give up on mitigation. You know, if we give up on mitigation, we're talking about a three to four degree, perhaps, global mean temperature by the end of the century. So it would be absolutely disastrous to give up on cutting emissions and stopping environmental damage. We have to redouble our efforts. But of course we have to adapt because we can't prevent everything. We're already at 1.2 degrees. We're probably gonna to get to near two degrees, even if we um, succeed in cutting emissions uh, deeply. So of course we have to adapt. We have to do both. And we have to do both uh, at a scale and a speed that we've never done before. So we can't give up on one or the other. We have to do both and we have to integrate them and make sure that they're synergistic. So they're not, they're not undermining each other. So if we just put air conditioning everywhere, yes, you might be able to reduce the indoor temperature of buildings, but you will increase the demands for electricity, you will burn more fossil fuels, at least under the current energy systems, and you will create a bigger urban heat island effects because you've got to pump the heat somewhere. So we have to integrate adaptation mitigation. There's a strong research agenda needed for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Could I ask uh, Edith and Thijs also to switch on their cameras uh, so that we see both of you as well? Yeah. Are there any comments between the speakers, Thijs, Edith? Uh, what's your response to the research agenda that uh, Andy tried to draft? Are there any priorities that you see in terms of what we should do, particularly now in research to help these transformative changes? Any comments from Edith or Thijs? Uh, 
I think I, I saw many, we were all quite aligned, I would say, <laughs> without uh, having, uh, you know, prepared it uh, together. Uh, and from that point of view, I think I, I completely agree with what Andy said. We need the models and the scenario thinking, but we also need to make this transformation into scaling up. Uh, scaling up nutrition, scaling up all the other activities. So really being active in, in practice and, and all the signs behind that. I, I especially, I put that in the chat, I especially liked the, your introduction of the transdisciplinarity. I think this is something that is perhaps not so much, you know, known to us in academia, but really very important to make the next step. Uh, yeah, not, not only here in the Netherlands, but also globally. Nice. So I have a question for Andy. To what degree do you think that implementation is, should be encouraged more? At least in the field that I'm working in, in emerging infectious diseases, I have the impression that for at least 20 years, we know what the underlying causes are. We provided recommendations for how to deal with these problems. Um, but they are not being taken on by human society because they don't fit into the current worldview. So I really like to have your view on, on how to uh, move this forward. How do we move forward with the things that we already know, but have not implemented in our society? Well, thanks. I mean, it's a great question. It's one that we could we could have a whole conference on. <laughs> you know, why are we not acting as we should? Uh, and I think I mean, the answer is probably in the political economy, isn't it? Uh, the fact is there are such strong vested interests in continuing to burn fossil fuels, in continuing to exploit food systems unsustainably. Um, these vested interests, uh, they're beyond the kind of scope of our traditional research agenda, but I think they're very important. And there's a wonderful book called The Merchants of Doubt by Naomi Oreskes, who's an American historian. And she really very elegantly, and I think compellingly, shows how it's no accident that we are where we are, because these powerful interests have actually stirred misinformation for many years. They're the same interests that have stirred doubts about the effects of tobacco, um, you know, they stirred doubts about climate change, you know, so, you know, we tend to be a bit kind of sometimes a bit naive, I think, in the research agenda. We think, oh, just provide the evidence and everyone will change. That's just not true. I mean, there's a lot of powerful interests that don't want to change. So that's not, I'm not a political economist. I wouldn't be a competent person to comment, but I do think we need to engage those people who understand governance systems, political econ economics, the fact that we don't internalize the costs of our system. So we, there's a free rider problem. You know, the, the people who are selling us fossil fuels, when we fill up our car, we don't pay the full economic cost, you know, of, of that. So uh, now that's a political problem, but it's also a problem, I think, of the kind of governance systems and political economy. So some of it is without with the trans traditional scientific paradigm, but I think we have to get, we have to be aware of it, otherwise we're just being naive. But there is also a technical issue, which is around implementation science and implementation research. And to, in the conventional research arena, implementation of science is not seen as very high prestige. It's not very interesting. It's low prestige, and a bit boring. You know, who's interested in that kind of stuff? You know, what's really important is sort of molecular biomedicine. But I think that's the wrong way of conceptualizing it. I actually think it's extremely intellectually challenging as far as I can see. And I can't claim myself to have contributed very much to implementation science, but it is actually a very complex field. It does involve a whole range of different disciplines. And the challenge of scaling up what we know to be effective is a really important scientific challenge. So I'd like to see our research funders putting a lot more effort and a lot more resources into implementation science, as well as in generating some of the potential solutions. And of course, it's only through implementation science whether you find that your solutions have been right, <laughs> because you may have developed this wonderful solution, but when you scale it up, it has some unintended adverse consequence, which you're not really aware of. And so implementation science, it seems to me, is an absolutely vital part of the whole kind of scientific endeavor and we need to support those colleagues who work in that field and, and embrace it more thanks yeah thank you i, I see one other question among the uh, in the question and answer um section um i would love to hear the speaker's thoughts on the fact that scaling down fossil fuels fast enough to truly protect planetary health means fundamentally changing the structures of the global economy i myself the speaker the, the, the person who asked the question 
um, writes, I myself believed that the planetary health community is currently not addressing this enough, the, the necessity of changing the global economy. Um, any comments on that fundamental question? Andy, perhaps? Well, I mean, just... Yeah, I think Andy it, can start, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. I mean, I totally agree. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's, it's a bit outside my competence as a public health, but, but you know, that you can't be um, unaware of this when you get involved in this agenda. Of course, uh, it, it's due to the fact that our economy, you know, we're subsidising our own destruction. <laughs> and I think the historians of the future will look back and say, what were these people playing at? You know, why, why were they not charging, the, why were they not externalising these kind of costs? Um, and in as much as we can calculate them at all. Uh, so why do they kind of allow this to happen? So I, I totally agree. Um, I think there is a challenge. There are some technical issues about how you value some of these changes and so on, and the changes need to be uh, implemented. But at the heart of it, a lot of it is based on the kind of fact that there are very powerful lobbies that can lobby decision makers to say, no, sorry, we don't want, we want the subsidies to continue because we're going to benefit from them. Uh, and I'm afraid we do see that uh, around the world. I, I think that our early career colleagues, uh, younger colleagues are much more prepared to embrace some of the changes that are going to be needed. I suppose the question in my mind is, are they going to get into positions of power quickly enough in order to be able to pull these levers to put us on a more sustainable direction? And how can we embrace those parts of the private sector that do want, that do actually embrace a different business model? Because I think what we're seeing at the moment, and it's including some of the parts of the financial sector, they actually really want to invest in decarbonisation. Yes, that's what I was wanting to say. Help, yeah. how, and how they perhaps, yeah. Doing that? I think now what there is, yeah, maybe Andy can uh, reflect on that as well. But now I feel we are at a, at a certain tipping point, I would say, in the, in the yeah. in the twenty first century, with COVID crisis and now the Glasgow meeting and so on and so on, and many young people, you know, uh, eating less meat, uh, thinking really seriously about the the climate change and what it's going to mean for their future. I think we are now in an important time frame, I would say, where I see more attention also politically and also from the from the governments uh, yeah to, to pay attention to these problems I, that, that do, you, sounds, do you agree yeah that I'm, sounds I'm like optimistic. a nice point to end on <laughs> okay it's it's <laughs> yes. 5 30 here in the netherlands i agree and, i agree uh, i think we've reached the end of the program uh, before everybody leaves and we are still the only <laughs> ones left speaking i think i should um, uh, finalize this program uh, by thanking uh, all of the speakers, including Samuel Myers, um, for their really wonderful presentations. And I think you've given the Commission, the Royal Dutch Academy's Commission on Planetary Health, a lot of inspiration for developing the research agenda that we will be drafting uh, in the next six months or so. So, again, thank you to. Andy Haynes, Edith Feskens, Thijs Kuiken, and Samuel Myers for their presentations. Thank you all to all those who were in the audience listening and some of them raising questions that we have listed and um, that will be part of the um, report of this meeting. Thank you and I think we will now close this session.